Hello friends, here Dr. Arshad Nadeem Awan again with the ultrasound and radiology teaching video. In continuation with my previous uh, CT brain anatomy videos, this is the part third video, part three video, and in which I'm going to discuss about the vascular territories causing infarct or hemorrhage. This would be a clear video regarding the ischemic infarct, or regarding the hemorrhagic stroke. This will cover the intracranial or intracerebral hemorrhage. It will cover the epidural hemorrhage, the subdural hemorrhage. It will also cover the small vascular disease around. We'll talk about the density and the density changes. All this information would be on that video. So before going to watch that, must watch the part one video which is basically about the anatomy and how you will appreciate on the CT images. The second video must watch that that is regarding the territory, uh, vascular territory which vessel is involving which part of the brain and this is the third one you will be able to understand how the stroke and how the infarct uh, will appear on the CT images and which supply would be there and which part of the brain it would be. So all these would be included in this video. So let's start watching these images. Continuation with the previous uh, videos uh, in which I have already covered the basics of brain CT scans. Uh, two video has already been uploaded part one and part two uh, explaining everything regarding the CT brain basics. Uh, in the previous image or uh, in the previous videos where uh, we have already discussed about the territories of the arterial artery. So distribution of the arterial uh, uh, territories uh, which we have already covered in the previous unit uh, including the cardiovascular accident and uh, we have talked about the mid and uh, uh, mid, uh, mid cerebral arteries and anterior cerebral arteries and posterior cerebral artery beside this we have also discussed about the vertebral basilar system so here there is some another important information is in on this video that would be an ischemic events which is caused by small vessel disorders or it may also call as a chronic or small vessel disease or chronic small vessel disease in small vessel disease tiny arteries these gets occluded by a senile process or you may call it an aging process usually happens in old age however you cannot see that uh, in younger age unless there is any pathology or any arteriopathy so look at uh, this image you will appreciate that uh, there is a loss of brain parenchyma especially uh, where the white matter is and uh, beside this uh, there 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 are tiny arteries present in the white matter so due to occlusion of the tiny at, uh, arterial occlusion you may see small tiny strokes which eventually give, give rise to increase the density of the white matter so that's why it's an area where there is increased density and that's the area where uh, there is white matter particularly at paraventricular distribution here on this image you can appreciate that in paraventricular distribution there is increased uh, density around the anterior horn and posterior horn of the lateral ventricle so this image is uh, um, i mean this image shows that uh, there is a small vessel disease and because of that you may be able to see the increased density of the white matter particularly uh, around the paraventricular distribution and anterior and posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. On this CT axial image a particular pathology has shown uh, which is called as lacunar infarct. Lacunar infarct is uh, the in area of infarct less than one centimeter in diameter. You cannot appreciate the new lacunar infarct. You can only appreciate the old lacunar infarct because of the fact that in the new lacunar infarct happens to be isodense and can only be seen on MRI diffusion weighted images. As the time passed on the lacunar infarct, it gets old and becomes uh, hypodense and there will be increased density. 
and it will appear as a circular oval shaped halo. Uh, this is actually the brain CVA sometime it may be symptomatic or may be asymptomatic again it depends upon the location where the location of the lacunar infarct is uh, on this images you can also appreciate the small vessel disease around the periventricular distribution because the patient was uh, not young it's a bit old patient and you can appreciate the small uh, vessel disease around the periventricular distribution so here on this image it's uh, visible you can appreciate the lacunar infarct associated with small vessel disease for the evolution of the uh, cerebrovascular accident you have to look for those which i have discussed in the previous part two uh, video those stand for you have to look for the territory uh, and you have to look for its hypodensity and then edema around and swelling around and the last point was an evaluation so far the evolution is concerned you have to look and follow the cva and the stroke uh, follow it up uh, to uh, look for the changes over time so that is one important point is evolution so we are going to talk about the evolution in these images look at to the left parietal lobe it is a uh, ischemic infarct and it is in the middle cerebral artery uh, territory edema you can appreciate around you can also appreciate the effacement of uh, cortical sulci it means that there is no blood supply when there is no blood supply the uh, area will have to die and then it may get shrunk and then it may appear as an hypodense so after a while you will be able to see like there is something missing in here and uh, this is a complete hole so there is no white matter left just white matter is replaced by the fluid density and that is a csf density and this is called as porencaphaly so porencaphaly you may call it as a porencaphaly cavity or you may call it as an porencaphaly cyst or may call it a porencaphaly lesion whatever you want it to and here uh, you can appreciate that there is uh, because of the old ischemic infarction this is an old ischemic infarction beside this just adjacent to this lesion you can also appreciate the small lacunar, uh, lacunar infarct and also small uh, vessel disease is also visible in this images As we have already discussed about the ischemic stroke quite at length, now there is a time to speak about the hemorrhagic stroke. You know that there are two types of strokes, either ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke. The one thing is, uh, so far the hemorrhagic stroke is concerned, there is need to be thrombolytic medicines. But if you misdiagnose that and you put this, uh, you ignore these uh, findings so uh, general physician or medical specialist will put the patient on thrombolytic medication which is already contraindicated in the hemorrhagic uh, uh, stroke uh, it's mean that uh, you are giving death sentence to the patients so far the hem hemorrhage is concerned uh, hemorrhage or blood uh, happens to be denser than the soft tissue but it is less dense than the bone here on this image towards the uh, right side you can appreciate that there is a left basal ganglia hemorrhage surrounded by a hypodense rim of edema and uh, it causes uh, compression to the left ventricle and uh, beside this is also causing the midline shift to the right side another point to be clarified here that why it is hemorrhage and it's not the calcification mind you that hemorrhage has always mass effect while uh, calcification does not so for the calcification is concerned here you can see uh, choroid plexus calcification in view and you have to compare these both densities so you will find that the calcification has a greater density than the blood now come to the next view uh, and the image towards the right side here you can also appreciate the intraparenchymal hematoma and uh, it's a posterior aspect of the parietal lobe and it is again an uh, intraparenchymal hematoma. 
Here on this image you can appreciate the gangliothalamic uh, capsular region uh, hemorrhage that is intraparenchymal hemorrhage and it is causing mass effect surrounding uh, uh, increased density indicating that there is a, a soft tissue edema around and also causing compression on the lateral ventricle. The artery which supplied that territory uh, is the lenticulostriate artery which is the branch of the middle cerebral artery and it is the most common artery which causes intraparenchymal hemorrhage. It is basically the feeding artery of the basal ganglia and you would uh, commonly see uh, this uh, artery will get rupture in those uh, patients who have already having uncontrolled hypertension. So because of the uncontrolled hypertension, this lenticulostriate artery gets rupture and it will give rise to the intra uh, parenchymal hemorrhage, particularly at the, at the site of the basal ganglia, which you can appreciate on this image. So the hemorrhage is visible and the surrounding edema can be seen. Uh, in the view, you can see the choroid plexus calcification hematoma is visible so that was a patient of uncontrolled hypertension and ended up with intraparenchymal hemorrhage at basal uh, ganglia region again it's an intraparenchymal uh, hematoma it's uh, involving the right basal ganglia and it is uh, supplied by the lenticulostriate artery the territory of lenticulostriate artery which is the branch of the middle cerebral artery here you can see that there is a mass effect uh, on the adjacent ventricle uh, there is minimal uh, uh, you can say min midline shift as well and uh, beside this you can all see that on the subsequent images that this is quite a big uh, intra parenchymal hematoma here on this slide you can appreciate three uh, axial images so i will talk about the first images which is uh, actually it is not in the territory of the basal ganglia because uh, you can see that the thalamus uh, are intact and the basal ganglia is intact so it's more look like that it's a deeper part of the left parietal lobe so this is what the hematoma is and you can appreciate that there is surrounding uh, mass effect is also there and uh, surrounding edema can uh, be appreciated on this image And now Have we look into the, the middle third slide, image towards that is the left right side, right you can appreciate that this is a, but you uh, have to appreciate you can appreciate hematoma, but it is one of the important uh, hypertensive that is called this as more hematocrate uh, like level. Uh, uh, whenever AV there is hematocrate level, AV mean that the will present red blood cell has been sedimented uh, and it's that making it causes compression uh, fluid on the blood fluid uh, level which is quite right side uh, visible uh, here and, and this, this would not be a fresh hematoma line shift can be visible on this image. Another slide explaining intraparenchymal hemorrhage in the area of the middle cerebral artery perforators that is a lenticulostriate artery which is affecting the ganglio uh, uh, which is affecting the ganglio-capsular region here uh, there are multiple infarcts you can see that mm, I mean every image it's showing that there is a ganglio-capsular region infarct which is the territory of the lenticulostriate artery so this is for the better understanding you can appreciate the surrounding edema as well however uh, not uh, uh, midline shift is there and not major comp uh, compression can be seen on the lateral uh, ventricle uh, ventricles uh, but so far the mass effect is concerned you can see to some extent uh, slightly mass effects around the hematoma In case of intraparenchymal hemorrhage, it is important that the bleeding uh, should be uh, calculated and the calculation of the amount of the intraparenchymal hematoma is very much important. That is because of the reason that whenever we need to have the follow-up scan, we should know whether 
it is stable or it's going to be increase in amount or it is going to be decrease in amount so we can, cannot do it without calculating the amount of the uh, volume of the blood formula for uh, estimation of the calculation of the blood volume is uh, ellipsoid formula the same we are using for the prostate and for the pre-void volume and for the estimation of the abscess volume so that is ellipsoid formula and that is length by the width and by the height and multiply by 0 0.52 so it will come up with the volume here on this image you can appreciate you have to take uh, its uh, uh, width and you have to take its length and then measure all the slices because each slice is of one uh, mm cut and you have to just count that and then at the end you have to multiply with 0 0.52 and this will uh, give you the exact volume a bleeding can be either parenchymal or maybe subarachnoid uh, bleeding intraparenchymal bleeding will be surrounded by the brain parenchyma while subarachnoid space middle fox a quadrigeminal cistern and other cistern of the brain will be opacified in subarachnoid hemorrhages here on this image you can appreciate uh, uh, intracranial or intracerebral hemorrhage that is a hypertensive bleed you can uh, appreciate there and uh, that is within or surrounded by the uh, brain parenchyma how our uh, subarachnoid space is concerned you can see the mid uh, midline bleed you can also see the quadrigeminal cistern and you can also see the other cisterns are in prepontine cisterns um, can be visible that the blood is in there and uh, high density can be seen here so that is the difference between the uh, intraparenchymal bleeding and the subarachnoid bleeding in the last image you can appreciate that there is hematoma in the area in the uh, left side with the extension of uh, bleeding into the ventricular system so you can appreciate that there is blood within the lateral horn of the lateral ventricle or occipital horn of the lateral ventricle so it means that the bleeding has extended into the ventricular system on this image you can appreciate intraparenchymal hematoma involving the left parietal lobe uh, you can uh, see uh, the swelling around you can see edema around you can also appreciate a small hematocrit level it means that it's not the fresh blood so uh, the, the another point which is worth noting here multiple hemorrhagic uh, or hemorrhages small hemorrhages can also be seen adjacent to the large hematoma uh, so far the subarachnoid spaces are concerned these are all intact and there is no subarachnoid bleeding in that case here on this image you can see that the intraparenchymal hematoma which is extending into the right cerebral surface causing mass effect compression of the right lateral ventricle is visible and also extends into the cerebral sulci look at that blood is also extending into the cerebral uh, sulci subarachnoid extension can also be seen so this is basically subarachnoid uh, extension and uh, intraparenchymal bleeding with subarachnoid extension on the bone window uh, down here you can appreciate that there is a fracture it's mean that uh, uh, because of the fracture uh, they, this fracture has injured the artery and as a result subarachnoid hemorrhage in addition to the intraparenchymal hemorrhage occurred intracerebral hemorrhage without uh, a ventricular extensions examples are given in this slide a look at that these, these uh, hemorrhages are completely surrounded by brain parenchyma overlying subarachnoid spaces are normal ventricular system is clear there is no blood within the ventricular system and cerebral sulci has no blood in it so that is purely uh, intracerebral hemorrhage or intracerebral hematoma without the extension into the ventricular system
on these images you can appreciate that there is a hematoma on the left side and on the left side hematoma you can see these extension can be seen in the third ventricle the blood can be seen in the fourth ventricle blood can also be seen in the uh, sulci and the salvian fissures and uh, you can also see these posterior horn uh, occipital horn of the lateral ventricle these shows there is some blood in it so this is purely intra cerebral hematoma with extension into the cerebral uh, ventricles or extension into the ventricular system one another point should be noted that here you can also appreciate that there is hematocrit uh, level both in occipital horns and uh, you can also appreciate the blood in the prepontine system as well so this is a completely uh, blood extension into the ventricular system here is the another example having an intra cerebral hematoma with extension into the ventricular system here you can see that the third ventricular shows the blood product in it as far as occipital horn of the lateral ventricles are concerned you can see the hematocrit value due to uh, hematocrit level uh, due to the rbc sedimentation beside this uh, sub uh, arachnoid spaces also shows the uh, blood within it so uh, this is what intraparenchymal hemorrhage or intraparenchymal hematoma with uh, surrounded by the edema and also intraventricular extension here on this slide uh, there is an indication of rupture anterior communicating artery aneurysm because if you concentrate on you will see in the midline anteriorly there is major part of the bleeding is visible in the subarachnoid hemorrhage is visible in the in the area particularly anteriorly and especially at the midline which is the part for the which is the area for the anterior communicating artery so this is most likely be a rupture anterior communicating artery aneurysm so you can uh, see that the ventricles are full of blood both lateral ventricles are filled with the blood if you concentrate on so the lateral ventricle in the on the midline is also filled with the blood so this is what the uh, blood within the ventricular system this is another example of the aneurysm of the anterior communicating artery here you can appreciate that the uh, internal hemisphere fissure which shows the blood in it and here uh, you can see uh, just next to it there is a thrombus surrounded by the hemorrhage uh, beside this uh, supracellular cistern also shows the blood within it the fourth ventricle is showing blood within it and interpeduncular uh, cistern also showing the blood in it so it's mean that there is a blood in the subarachnoid space and in the prepontine cistern in the middle uh, you can see the blood along the middle cerebral artery as well fourth ventricle and ambien cistern on the right and left both uh, shows the blood in it so for the sylvian fissure is concerned you can still see the blood in it so this is what the subarachnoid hemorrhage is here you can appreciate that there is a right cerebellar hemisphere uh, hematoma with the extension into the ventricular system uh, you can appreciate here that the dilated temporal horn of the lateral, uh, lateral ventricle can be seen because of the hydrocephalus and uh, you can also appreciate that there is a blood in the third ventricle as well so hematoma is in the cerebrum in in the both films in the cerebral uh, cerebellum or cerebellar hemisphere here on this image you can appreciate that uh, blood uh, is in the fissures along the prepontine cistern and uh, you can also appreciate the blood in the ambient cistern and also blood in the fourth uh, ventricle so this is what the clear example of the uh, blood within the uh, fissures here on this image you can appreciate the acute infarct so the one question is how do you know that uh, this is acute infarct uh, or this is not the chronic one because uh, it is edema and if you uh, look for the surrounding sulci you uh, see that these sulci are overlying sulci are faced because of the edema uh, however if you compare it with the normal side towards the left so there is uh, normally 
विजिबल सुलकाय और सुलसाय बट ऑन द राइट साइड यू कॉन्ट सी दैट बिकॉज ऑफ द एडिमा एंड दैट टेरेटरी इज पर्टिकुलरली द टेरेटरी ऑफ राइट मिडल सेरेब्रल आर्ट्री सो दिस इज राइट मिडल सेरेब्रल आर्ट्री एक्यूट इन फॉक्ट हेयर ऑन दिस एमेज यू कैन अप्रिशिएट दैट द सुलसाय आर प्रोमिनेंट दैट इज बिकॉज ऑफ द डिफ्यूज ब्रेन एट्रॉफी but beside this if you focus on the anterior horns of the lateral ventricle you will be able to see the irregular hypodense white matter uh, in the periventricular distribution at the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle which is indicating that this is periventricular small vessel disease so this is what the periventricular small vessel disease is if you concentrate on focus on the right sided uh, occipital horn of the lateral ventricle you will be able to see fluid level and that is a hematocrit level it mean that the red blood cell is sedimenting uh, in in the uh, posterior horn of the lateral ventricle that is intraventricular bleed here on this image you can uh, appreciate the blood in the sulci so here or sulci you can call it so there is sulcal blood you know sulci blood on the left side while on the right side on the opposite side uh, the uh, sulci are normal so this is particularly subarachnoid hemorrhage the one important point worth noting here is subarachnoid hemorrhage patient will come with a worse headache of the life you know this uh, would be a very worst headache and uh, this would not be a simply headache and uh, some people call it as a thunder clap so but uh, but anyway uh, the patient will have be having a very severe headache of the life and um, this is uh, happens while there is a small amount of blood or even massive blood you have already seen both slides so in that case where the sulci is uh, uh, showing the blood uh, however between these both gyrises on the right side it's appear normal on the left side uh, you are able to see the small amount of blood so this is what small subarachnoid hemorrhage here on this image you can appreciate intracerebral hematoma or intracerebral bleed and uh, it is surrounded by the edema if you focus on the uh, uh, medial aspect of that uh, hemorrhage you will be able to see that uh, this blood has got extension into the uh, sulci so these sulci is also appears white and look at the uh, occipital area this sulcus also showing uh, blood in it so this is intra cerebral hematoma with extension into the ventricular system here on this image uh, right on the top you can see that the fourth ventricle shows uh, blood within it and then if you comes down so you will be able to see in the midline the third ventricle also shows uh, blood within it and then if you focus on the lateral ventricle posterior horn occipital horn it also shows the uh, blood presence uh, if you concentrate on you will be able to see that there is intra uh, cerebral hemorrhage in the ganglio capsular region the region uh, where there is a lenticular striate artery supplies and there is a possibility of uh, uh, having aneurysm here so in that condition it is recommended that you should have to have a angiography conventional angiography to look for the thrombus because because of the thrombus you are able to see that there is a hydrocephalus formation so in that condition you have to have a angiography to look for the presence or absence of the thrombus so now come to the point of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage due to aneurysm what is aneurysm actually it is dilatation of the artery it's a focal dilatation of the artery where the walls of the artery gets weak as a result it get uh, rupture with minimal insert with increased blood pressure or with excessive movements on this particular image you can appreciate that there are blood in the cisterns ambien cistern in the quadrigeminal cistern and in the prepontine cistern in the suprasalar cistern and also in the salivian fissure so indicating that there is subarachnoid hemorrhage in the uh, cisterns here on this image uh, you would be able to see 
the density surrounded by the clot in the right frontal lobe that's a focal clot and that's a particular site of the aneurysm so whatever the modality you started you wanted to use maybe mri or maybe catheter angiogram uh, you may use or put the coil inside to stop the bleeding or you may have to do it surgically by clapping the artery uh, and beside this if you focus on you may be able to see that there is hydrocephalus uh, and uh, the dilated temporal horn of both lateral ventricles indicating that there must be some thrombus in it which is resulting into the hydrocephalus. Subdural hematoma and extradural hematoma is one of the very important topic. What is the difference between these two? So epidural is called as ep mean above. So that lies between the bone inner table of the skull and the dura. That part, that place will be called as a epidural space or epidural area. If the hemorrhage take place here, so that would be an epidural hemorrhage and that is usually arterial bleeding. Now the question is which artery passes through that. So mind you that it is basically most of the time it's a meningeal, middle meningeal artery which is the branch of the maxillary artery and the maxillary artery is the branch of external carotid artery. So the middle meningeal artery uh, supply the dural area and if any um, rupture or any cut uh, occurs to the middle meningeal artery this will result into the epidural hematoma mind you that the artery has a very strong smooth muscles wall very strong in anatomical structure it cannot easily get cut or ruptured until there is a significant force so whenever there is epidural hematoma always look for the fracture uh, on the skull vault and if you notice any fracture on the skull vault so must look for the others as well because there will be multiple fractures there how to appreciate the epidural hematoma it would appear as a lens shape it will separate the dura from the bone and it uh, will appear as a lens shape the one thing another you should have to keep in mind that it will always respect the suture it does not extend beyond the suture for example here you can see that is a frontal suture which separates from the parietal suture parietal area so that is a coronal suture which separates the frontal and parietal so it will respect that it will respect all the sutures maybe sagittal suture or lambdoid suture whenever in between that it will not cross the suture so this is one of the important point to be noted so it will always appear in a lens shape as far as subdural uh, hematoma is concerned it's mainly venous in nature and it is low pressure bleeding uh, because of the fact that the veins have uh, a thin wall and it, it easily get ruptured with minimal trauma however you won't be able to see any fracture associated with the subdural hematoma so these veins are lying uh, in the skull vault uh, located deep or away from the dura deep to the dura and that uh, these veins are called as bridging vein uh, it does not respect the sulci hematoma will always be crossing the suture uh, this is usually seen in older age group and that is because of uh, or secondary to the atrophic changes because of the secondary atrophic changes it gets elongated and subarachnoid space become increased so as a result these happens to be more elongated and can get ruptured with minimal insult so this is usually seen the subarachnoid hemorrhage usually seen in old patient and it does not uh, respect the suture it always crossing the suture and it also gets uh, or comes in the shape of overlying uh, brain parenchyma so now look on this image this is hemorrhage outside of the brain substance either it could be extradural or this may be subdural if it is extradural so it will arise between the inner table of the skull and the dura while if it is subdural this will arise between the dura and the arachnoid space 
So extra dural hematoma will usually arise from the injury to the medial meningeal artery and subdural would be due to rupture veins and these may be bridging veins. So extra dural will be uh, arterial blood and subdural will be venous blood and uh, extra dural will appear in a biconvex shape and uh, subdural will be in a crescent form and uh, extra dural will appear the hematoma is confined with a well defined margins and it uh, uh, will respect the sutures however hematoma uh, is more widely spread and a more irregular inner margin and will not respect the sutures and another extra dural hematoma will be seen in the uh, i mean after the injury while subdural hematoma is likely to see in old patients now look at uh, this slide it will show uh, subdural hematoma on the right side and uh, extra dural hematoma on the left side extra dural hematoma it does not cross the suture line that is on the right side uh, sorry correction so on the right side it's extra dural hematoma which does not cross the suture line on the right side uh, it crosses the suture line uh, it will appear as a crescent shape uh, so far sub uh, ex, uh, dural uh, hematoma is concerned while extra dural will appear as a uh, I mean um, convex shape so a clue to the diagnosis is if uh, you do not find ventricles first of all if you if there is no ventricle or if you did find the ventricle which is a phased so on one side or if ventricles are unequal then you have to look for any space occupying lesion or you have to look for intracerebral hematoma or you have to look for the massive infarction you should have to look for that and if uh, not found these three things then you have to look for the two problem that may be a subdural hematoma or maybe extra dural hematoma so first you have to look intracerebrally whether space occupying lesion or any hemorrhage or any infarction if not then look for the periphery for the subdural hematoma and for extra dural hematoma here on this uh, right sided image you can appreciate extra dural hematoma or you may call it uh, epidural hematoma uh, it is in lens form shape and uh, it is uh, bounded by the sutures like it respect the suture so this is usually seen in the old age if you come across such type of a fracture you should have to have the bone window first to look for the uh, fracture if there is fracture so you should have to do it again because to look for the other fracture as well so this is uh, more likely an old age atrophy subdural hematoma uh, happens to be uh, epidural hematoma happens to be in older age if you look into the another slide on the left side where you can form this crescentric shaped density and that is because of subdural hematoma or subdural hemorrhage so in that particular case you can appreciate the small vessels uh, ventricular disease so here you can also appreciate the small ventricular disease beside this the brain atrophic changes are clearly visible uh, ventricles are dilated and crescent shape uh, density is visible which is crossing over the fissures so which is crossing over the suture so that's mean that this is a subdural hematoma or oh, there's a quite marked difference between both things you can clearly identify which one is epidural hematoma and which one is subdural hematoma epidural hematoma as we mentioned it is an arterial blood while sub dural hematoma happens to be venous blood these are uh, mostly because of the veins and can be seen in the older age group so therefore you should have to be very careful for uh, for any sort of a, um, a brain insult or injury or trauma on this particular image in view you can appreciate a subdural hematoma which is crescent in shape and uh, these are indicated by the white arrow however surrounding there is no extra changes seen you can see calcification in the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle if you look to the contrast or contralateral cerebral hemisphere so you can appreciate that there is uh, uh, you can see the prominence of the sulci 
so which shows that this is um, earlier uh, i would say earlier brain atrophic changes so these are cerebral sulci you can see uh, this is prominent because of the csf production and shrinkage of the brain and even in the uh, false cerebra in the center you can also see precortical uh, area or precortical sulci uh, is filled uh, with the with the csf so which is <coughs> indicating that this is uh, earlier brain atrophic changes here on this uh, particular slide i have tried to explain the changes in the density in the color in the uh, uh, changes in the color of the hematoma and changes in the density uh, of the hematoma over time so uh, it it's likely that if you see that there is acute hematoma which you can appreciate on the very right slide that is a left sided acute subdural hematoma uh, which appears to be in a crescent form and this is acute hematoma so acute hematoma happens to be quite wide and there uh, will be increased density so because of this density uh, this would be considered as an acute uh, uh, hematoma and acute hematoma happens to be quite uh, wide and it appears to be quite dense uh, so far the changes in the density is concerned uh, whether it is uh, subdural hematoma or it is epidural hematoma all the way same this density changes apply on all over slides and all type of uh, hematomas within the brain look for the middle slide and this is what we call it as an subacute or isodense hematoma here on this you can appreciate that the right sided subacute or subdural hematoma with a mix, mixed density cannot differentiate from the brain parenchyma so what you can appreciate on this uh, particular image is that ventricle uh, on the same side ventricles are compressed you can also appreciate that the midline shift is there the one important point uh, worth noting here that the gray matter appears to be thick as compared to the contralateral side whenever you see that there is something changes in the gray matter and there is thickness in the gray matter so you must suspect uh, uh, hemorrhage or hematoma so this is what the case of subdural hematoma and uh, it will appear as isodense with the passage of time uh, this uh, density will become decrease and it will reach to an extent where it will be equal to the density of the surrounding uh, tissues surrounding brain parenchyma that's why it happens to be isodense which cannot be easily recognized on the ct images for that matter you have to have the mri and when you do the mri you will be able to see that a large uh, subdural hematoma is sitting over there so uh, keep in mind always focus on the central uh, midline shift always look for the compression of the ventricles and also look for the uh, thickness of the gray matter which will uh, be uh, an indirect indication especially on the ct images and then if you did find you must do the mr and in odd sequence of the mri you uh, will be able to see the subdural hematoma would be sitting uh, in the in the images one another now point the, worth uh, left side is if in third case slide, of bi you will be able to see the hematoma, the hematoma that obviously the appear as an so what happens on the late side and if you in the late stage one the part the other so will be will look all the way same so blood would be it, resolved uh, would be a really would difficult be, what would be the last problematic situation that would so be then you should have plasma be very careful and that is to be high you should have to look whenever compression hypodensity or placement of the ventricle or so that even thickness of area the will show that gray matter around is so all long. these points standing hematoma points needed to be taken into account in case of the it bilateral be the subdural hematoma so always suspect that in case of changes, bilateral as we hematoma, have discussed the case the of the acute hematoma confusing and would be difficult to diagnose dense and as far as the uh, long standing hematoma will appears to be hypodense where in this case you can appreciate that this is a hypodense hematoma and it is uh, easy to understand that the 
uh, time and the duration on the hematoma has been passed and this is a long standing hematoma. Then another point you should have to be careful for that that is called as acute on chronic hematoma. In that case if there is hypodense area and within the hypodense area you are able to appreciate uh, uh, hyperdensity it will show that within the uh, chronic hematoma there is rebleed and because of the rebleed you can appreciate the both density there the hypodensity and the hyperdensity but mind you that the hypodensity would be on the top and the uh, hyperdensity would be sedimented down so this will in, uh, this will uh, indicate that there is some acute on chronic uh, there is a bleeding acute on chronic so or you can call it acute on chronic hematoma so I mean like there was already existing chronic hematoma and uh, uh, there is rebleed and uh, because of the rebleed you can call it an acute on chronic hematoma here on this axial CT images you can appreciate that there is again a, a crescent shape uh, hematoma and that hematoma is of fluid density which is explaining that this is the chronic subdural hematoma and look for the other symptoms here so for the lateral horn of the uh, uh, temporal horn of the lateral ventricle is concerned it is compressed it is slightly displaced so that is indicating that this is the uh, due to uh, the chronic or long standing hematoma and that is a subdural hematoma as we have talked about the density at different stages acute uh, uh, chronic uh, isodensity and hyperdensity and hypodensity look at uh, this image here uh, we are going to explain some of the points related to acute on chronic hematoma focus on the upper right top image and here you can appreciate that this is a fluid density and this is a hypodense and it has caused mass effects on the frontal uh, cerebral hemisphere and the right cerebral hemisphere is showing that there is some compression effect beside this if you focus on the right cerebral hemisphere and the other uh, structure so you will be able to see that the ventricles are compressed on the right side and there is a midline shift on the right uh, towards the left side and the right side area is enlarged and dilated so on the contralateral side on the left side you can see that there is a, an early hydrocephalus because of the compression effect so all this mass effect is compressing on the right side and compression goes towards the left side as a result you are able to see that there is dilatation of the uh, posterior horn of the lateral ventricle on the left side because of the compression effect here on the same image again look for the another point look for the fluid density lesion down at the basal part it shows the blood density so what happened is actually that was a chronic hematoma and in chronic hematoma there was rebleed occur and because of the rebleed you can see the difference between the two densities on the superior or superfluent part there is a, a hyper a hypodensity that is a fluid density and in the basal part this is a blood density because the fresh blood has uh, sedimented downward uh, it is deposited the red cell deposited downward because of the gravity so here in the down you can see that there is a hyperdensity blood density on the above on the top hyperfluent area that is a hypodensity which is actually csf density or water density or plasma density so this shows that this is acute on chronic hematoma so uh, try to focus on uh, this pathology as well while you're looking for the subdural hematoma or epidural hematoma or even intracerebral hematoma here on this image again uh, you uh, may be able to see epidural hematoma so epidural hematoma uh, is a biconvex so this is biconvex and the density shows the blood density it is uh, white uh, uh, in appearance 
and uh, it shows that there is a blood density whenever you come across this uh, epidural hematoma you need to have the blood window why you need to have the blood window here because if you look around you cannot find this uh, uh, bone abnormality here when you do the bone window there is likely to have some trauma uh, but the second thing is the history will also support you whether there is a trauma or not because on the brain there is no features of any atrophy there is no features of any lacunar infarct there is no feature of any abnormality on the brain it's mean that the patient is quite young and that's not old patient so there is no possibility that this is because of the old age so there is mainly possibility of having this uh, hematoma because of the trauma so you have to focus like this is showing the respect for the suture so on the top there is a coronal suture and da down there is a lambdoid suture and this hematoma is bounded by the uh, suture so it has or uh, it shows the uh, suture respect so this is what the epidural hematoma would be on this image you can appreciate a uh, crescentic density along the uh, lateral surface or the cortex of the brain it does not respect the suture it has already crossed the suture coronal suture has been crossed lambdoid suture has been crossed so uh, this is sub dural hematoma subdural hematoma does not respect the suture beside this you can see that the surrounding sulci uh, underneath sulci are effaced so effacement of the sulci can also be seen so this type of or subdural hemorrhage uh, uh, hematoma will happens to be uh, due to venous bleeding and these veins is card are called as a bridging vein especially bridging vein and uh, subdural hematoma is likely to be uh, with the older age group so you might be able to see some other uh, findings related to old age atrophy so far this particular slide is concerned mild degree age atrophy can be seen that the sulci are uh, prominent here you can see that these sulci are prominent because of the in because of the csf presence in there so uh, this is particularly subdural hematoma and uh, you may be able to appreciate on these slides on these images so that is the end of this video and in the conclusion i would like to explain that if you want to understand the CT brain or the basics of CT brain, you must look for my video part 1 uh, basics of CT brain and part 2 basics of CT brain and part 3 which was this one video. In the part 1 video I have explained about the detailed anatomical structure with the help of images with the help of diagram I have explained all the anterior posterior and the middle cranial fossa and their uh, I mean uh, frontal lobes and middle lobes and temporal lobes all has been discussed at length with that with that I have also explained uh, at length about the basal ganglia and its structure so that would be worth watching uh, if it is related to anatomy in the part second video I have explained about the uh, territory that is about the vascular territory which area is supplied by which vessel and I have explained through the color schematic diagrams and I have also shown multiple images to make you understand that which territory or uh, which vascular territory it is and how you will understand that which part of the blood vessel is supplied to which part of the brain that is explained in part 2. And part 3 which is uh, this video and here I have explained at length about the type of the hematoma whether it is intraparenchymal or it is subdural or it is epidural everything has been discussed at length beside this I have also discussed the changes in the density changes over time how it will appear I have also discussed about the acute on chronic hematoma these all things has been discussed in this video so hopefully that part 1 part 2 and part 3 
video would be quite helpful for the medical students and for the residents of the radiology so uh, please subscribe my channel and keep sharing with other colleagues and uh, uh, keep practicing radiology uh, so in a way to help the community at large so we'll see you with some other informative videos uh, in future till then take great care of yourself thank you